Hi. Hello from Bethel Church. Yes, my husband's been on the senior team almost 20 years now. And I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I release a blessing also from our house at Bethel <laughs> over your church as a mom in the house. Whoa. <laughs> You know, there are times when I'm on the road, I travel, I travel all the time. I, I run, I, I started and now run the International Bethel Sozo Ministry. And um, how many of you have been sozoed in the room? Yeah, you can thank my husband for that. <laughs> he says that he's the guinea pig for all, all sozo. All the tools were worked on him over and over and over. Yeah, don't feel too sorry for him. It was good. <laughs> he needed it. Yeah. It's his joke, not mine, so okay. Um, but I, I know a lot of times when we travel, how many of you are here for shifting atmospheres? Okay, so you understand too that the other thing that I do is, is I really work at discerning the atmospheres, and we're going to talk a little bit about that for here. And, um, but when we travel, a lot of times it, it's hard to stay above the atmosphere sometimes. I mean, we, we have the authority, complete authority, but it's hard sometimes to not get pulled into to what's going on around you. And so um, I can remember sometimes being so overwhelmed, and I would say this, I would say, I call upon the prayers of the intercessors of the house. And I would feel success. I would feel the covering. And so I just, whoa, I just want to release... Hi, I just say to Dale and Ian as the leaders here, I'm giving you the right to call upon the prayers of the intercessors of our house. Oh, ha, ha, when you need reinforcements. Um, you know, they didn't even know we were calling upon it, and you could feel all the prayers that have been sewed in over all those years. You've got your intercessors. You're going to call on them first. But if you need reinforcements, I give you, as a mother of the house of Bethel, I give you permission to, authority to call upon those prayers. <sighs> and that's actually going to tie in a little bit with what we do today. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> So, mm. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. I declare that this region is a region of faith. I declare it. I declare that you're going to see miracles. I think you've seen some. I'm not trying to say, oh, we're bringing it. We're the all-powerful. No, this is not about us. This is about me declaring and partnering with something that's already here. Does that make sense? I'm calling it out. And some of you are like, yes, we get it. We've been walking in. How many of you have prayed for the sick and they've gotten better? Ha, <laughs> look at that. You guys totally are like, yeah, we are going to take this word. Okay, how many of you have prayed for the sick and they haven't gotten well? Keep trying. Yeah, that's it. You know what? If you never start, they'll never get healed. That's right. That's you know, don't worry about it. Yeah. You know, somewhere along the road, you're going to get the freedom. Yeah. And we're going to stop because I declare that this is a place of great faith. Yeah. How, how do I know that? There's two ways to determine if this is a place of great faith. One is that you see faith happening. You see the miracles, which we're starting to... The other one is, I see the attack of the enemy. Yeah. Yeah. And the attack of the enemy over this area is hopelessness. Yeah. Now, you know, you think, oh, you're just someone coming from outside telling us... No, 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 just, just listen and, and see if this makes sense. There is a subtle hopelessness over this area, which looks like... I can't, I won't, it, you know, it, it's not going to happen. Does that make sense to anyone? It's not like this outward assault against your faith, like, you know, you go to pray for the sick and people are getting well, because it's not this, this outward, oh, have faith, but what is faith? It is the substance of things hoped for. 
And the enemy knows if he can keep you from hoping, you won't walk in the faith of your region. You know, we teach some of the tools in Sozo, and one is, is our self-defense mechanisms, and blah, 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 I don't need to tell you all that. But one of mine was hopelessness. And it's like, well, how does hopelessness protect you? Do you know, if I don't hope, I'm never disappointed. And there's a sense whoa, here of just, just don't hope. Because you know what? If you hope and, and they don't get healed, or if you hope and you don't get the good grade on your test, it'll, you'll, it'll, you'll feel worse than if you had hoped. Am I getting some more people in here? Okay. All right. But you know, our hope has to be attached to something. So your hope can't be attached to you. I'm amazing. I'm great. You look in the mirror. Okay, you're awesome. You're great. You know, you're and getting ready. Okay, you, me, right here in this mirror. We're great. We're awesome. We're beautiful. Going to do great on that test. Now, there's a good self-talk. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Encourage yourself in the Lord. All of that is true. But your hope has got to be attached to something greater than you and your ability to succeed. David says, why are you cast down, O my soul? Hope in God, for I will once again praise you. <laughs> so we get into your region. I've been here a month. I've loved almost every moment being here. Um, there's a natural progression of winding down that happens when you get to the end. We've preached in many churches. My husband was, was with us with us, excuse me, for a couple weeks in between there, so don't feel sorry. My husband did get to come with your beautiful land, and we did get to connect, and, and he did a couple of seminars and preached, and we preached, and I don't know how many times I've been up in front of people this time around, and I, part of my stories out on the table is um, character of hope. I would suggest if you're struggling with hope, get that. Um, one of the other ones is undeferred hope. If you're keeping hope alive, but you're getting, you're still like, ah, it's never coming to pass, get that one. That's hope issues, and we're going to go a little bit past that, but those are some key things. But in undeferred hope, I talk about my knee, this knee, and having to get knee surgery, and having knee surgery and not having it go as well as it should, and complaining to God, and God saying, you're not seeing this correctly, and then showing how to see it. So there's... You know, keeping hope alive, keeping it going. What are we doing? Well, my knee, this knee has been great. I'm excited. I'm coming to New Zealand. I'm going to get to walk the hills. I'm going to get to do everything. And the day before I get on the final plane, I'm, I'm just kind of stretching, you know, getting ready. And this knee pops. And it has gotten worse and worse and worse and worse this trip. And I get here. Now, I've gone through, I've, I've climbed the mountains, I've done the beaches, you know, the, the other ladies had to leave me behind, but eh, I got to have some fun. And I didn't have a sense of hopelessness about my knee until I got here. <laughs> There's a subtleness to it. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this whole thing up so you guys can see. There is a natural progression of you're tired, you're done. But I want to say that that's not what's going on with my knee. I get here, I, I get in the hotel, I prop my leg up, and I say, God, I am so done with my knee hurting. Listen to that word, done, because we're going to play on that in a little bit. So we've been to your wonderful country. Um, I have been doing, working well at losing weight. Some of the, uh, we, we travel all the time, so it's really hard. My son came home for Christmas, and I just threw away all the dieting and had fun. So I came a little bit heavy, but my clothes still fit. I tried them on before I came. I've learned that in traveling. <laughs> and I thought, that's okay because, you know, we're going to do all of our walking. We're going to do all of our, I'm going to be with people who eat well. It's going to be great. Not. So <laughs> we were trying on our clothes, getting ready for here, and... It's like, oh, these pants, they're not going to fit anymore. They're done. Done. 
And we're going to have to preach. And, and we're, you know, we've been so excited. What can we preach? What can we release? We have been trained to be a gift. You know, and we're wondering, oh, can we even pull off another sermon? I think we're just done. And this all now reminds me to something that happened in 2013 um, as I was praying in Bethel. In the beginning of 2013, I had so many people that were coming to this center, the Transformation Center, we're sozo, we're inner healing, we're um, deliverance um, in all of that, but then we have counselors, we have a whole barrage of, of trauma work, we have all kinds of ways, and all of us got together, there is a theme of the people coming, they're done, they're just done. They've been married for 30 plus years, and they come in, I'm done. And no matter what you did, no matter how much freedom they got in their sessions, they walked out still, yeah, this is awesome, but I'm still done. Missionaries, been on the field 20 plus years coming in, just burned out, and like, yeah, but you know what, doesn't matter, God loves me, yes, we could take on the world again, but we're done, we're not going back. There was a sense of being done. And we had some attacks on situations where um, one of my friends, who's just this amazing person that's been working with um, the poor in our area, and just the down and out, and just really always financially making it hand to mouth because they can't really help, they can't pay, so she has to get donations, and just doing a fabulous work in, believe it or not, the inner city of Reading, which we do have a small inner city. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> If you've been there, it's like, really, I'm an inner city? Yeah, yeah, we do. We have a very low social economic area that she's taking care of. And um, she's going through all the stuff. She's working hard. She's getting some freedom. Her people start blowing out. A schizophrenic guy who's been completely healed just starts spinning out and ha you know, going back this way. Um, some of the people that she's been working with with mental illness who have been in their right mind for years just start just... And she's like, what's going on? Her helper gets hit, run down by a car. Her adopted son gets killed. All of this happens, and she sits down and she says, I think I'm done. She says, it feels like everything I've put my hands to in the plow is coming to naught, to nothing. And it clicks. There has been an assignment released in the beginning of 2013 for the word undone. And it comes... We find it in scripture in Nehemiah, in Nehemiah 4, 1 through 3. Now it came about that when Sanballat heard that, there, that we were building the wall, he became furious and very angry and mocked the Jews. He spoke up in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria and said, Why are these feeble Jews, what are they, these Jews doing? Are they going to restore this wall for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish it in a day? Can they revive these stones from the dusty rubble, even the burned ones? What is that? It's a mocking spirit. Yeah. How many of you felt mocked? Yeah. Yeah. Try to hope. Yeah. Oh, who do you think you are that you should be able to pull yeah. this off? Mom. Why do you think you should be able to have this award? Or what makes you think you're better than everybody else? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was near him and he said, even what they are building. So in other words, he's going to say, okay, even if they can do all of this, they get through the mocking spirit and they decide we're going to soldier on and we're going to do this and they make it happen. He says, even if they can do this, what they are building, if a fox should jump on it, he would break their stone wall down. And I felt like the assault that's coming here is the same that we felt here, is a subtle one, but it's the same we felt in the beginning of 2013 at Bethel. The sense of undone. Even if you rise above discouragement, it's like the enemy's like, oh, it's okay. Even if they rise above and begin to hope, it won't, it won't work and they'll just crumble to the ground. It'll become undone. But I declare to you, this is a place of faith. 
not just this church. No, this church is a light of faith. It's a place where you guys can get together and you can rub shoulders and say, how did it work? Did he get healed? No, okay, well, try again. This is where we can encourage one another so that we don't lose heart. Okay? But this city, this region is a place of faith. And the enemy is watching you guys, and he's like, okay, they're starting to believe, so I'm just going to throw on this wet blanket that says, okay, you can just keep believing, and you can see a couple people healed, but it won't last. It'll just crumple to the ground. And I declare that is a lie. Ah. And I declare that if you're going to walk in the faith of your region, you are going to have to displace hopelessness inside yourself and over the area. And I will say one other thing. I'm going to have the worship team come up. Probably one of the shortest sermons you've ever had here. Probably not as funny as Ian either. I heard he can tell stories and just make you laugh the whole time. But I'm going to declare something about the word undone. See, to me, the enemy can only mimic. He can't create. Now, he can read the times. And if the enemy is releasing this undone, 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 he's only being able to release it because there is an undoneness that needs to happen in us. God wants you undone. But he doesn't want you undone in the sense of failure. He doesn't want you undone in the sense of, oh, it'll never happen. He wants you undone in the sense that it is time for our flesh to bow. It is time for our unbelief to give way. It is time for us to say, okay, God, I am undone to your world. I I am stepping in to this place where I am over my head. And only you are going to be able to back me up. I'm walking out of a place where I know all the answers. (laughs) I'm walking past safety. You know, where I can stand here. You know, the Lord told me years ago, whomever you touch will be made well. Spiritually, physically, and mentally. And I've seen amazing spiritual wellness when I prayed for people. I've trained people around the world to have that same ability. I've seen people in their souls get completely right minds. But I've seen very few physical healings. I've seen them some, but not a ton. And what I've done so many times is I stand on this side of safety at what I'm good at. And I don't see a ton of physical healings because I don't see past my security. I'm like, well, well, Bill will pray for you if you need, if you have cancer. He'll take care of that. I'll take care of mental illness. I'll take care of people that need to connect to God. Do you see that? And my safety, my assuredness in what I can do, because God's done it so long, has kept me from this place of stepping out where I need him to come through again. I think that if we're going to beat this region, you're going to have to start stepping out and saying, God, I couldn't pull this off. And so I'm not the one failing and I'm not the one succeeding. I'm just stepping out. And if this rises something in you where you're like, number one, I have felt the hopelessness here. I want you to stand and we're going to pray. I'm going to have you repeat some things. What's interesting about this region is it's subtle. You know, like our pants not fitting and oh, those jeans are done. Well, we've been wearing them not fitting for four weeks. But there was something here about, no, we're not going to keep that up. I'm going to have you repeat some things. I want you to say this out loud. I ask you, God, to forgive me. for agreeing with the atmosphere for partnering with hopelessness 
for wanting to give up, for wanting to chuck it in. Uh And today, I declare, I am turning the dial on the radio station. I'm not going to listen to the voice of the enemy. I say to you, enemy, I see you, discouragement. I see you, disappointment. I see you, performance and perfectionism. I'm not partnering with you anymore. And I'm going to take this step into the region that we carry here. Of faith. Of trust. That is without borders. Because I want to walk in what Jesus died for. And I release hope into my spirit into my home, into my family, into my schools and businesses. And I declare that as I walk in hope, I'm going to step into faith. As they sing this, If you feel that tug on you of, oh man, this is totally what we're needing here. I'm going to invite you to come forward for prayer. We'll lay hands on you. We're not going to spend time sorting things out because it's God that's going to sort it out. But we're just going to lay hands and impart. And I'm I'm doing it not from this place of, oh, Bethel's amazing, but I do believe in the laying on of hands. I do believe in that. I believe that Bethel has fought the fight for hope. You don't know that. You just see us now. You should have seen us 20 years ago when we were struggling to pay our bills and grew our church from 2,500 to 250 people. (laughs) We, We spent a lot of time with our face on the ground. It's the presence of the Lord. Don't go after the miracles. Go after the presence. The presence will bring the miracles. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cost you. And if you're going to come forward, it's going to be saying, I'm, I'm going to take this step of cost. It's going to cost you to look foolish. It's going to cost you to pray for that person at the bank and, and actually reach out and touch them rather than saying, oh, I'll pray for you and then go home and pray. No, you're going to start saying, can I pray for you? And they're going to say, oh, okay. And you're going to reach your hand out and touch them. And they may or may not get better then. And you're, you're going to have to see them the next day. 365 times you go to the to the bank and it's going to make you feel foolish if they didn't get the healing but remember something always happens when you pray I had a friend he got picked out on a treasure hunt and I thought oh my gosh he has AIDS and I'm like oh my gosh I'm thinking he must have gotten healed because they were like, okay, this, this, this. And he came up and I said, well, well, did you get healed? And he said, no, but I got loved. Something always happens when you pray. Don't make it about the miracle. Make it about the person that you're praying for. Make it about releasing hope, releasing the ability to say, we are the only people on the earth that serve a God that's real. We're the only ones. We are the only ones that can bring true hope because hope has to be attached to something other than our human ability. Hope in God. Hope in the promises of His Word. But it's going to take courage. And this line is only for those that are not faint of heart.